All right, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And it's really a, a special, uh, very special thrill for me uh, to be introducing uh, Ed Zwick because uh, he and I have been friends uh, since childhood. In fact, since uh, really we were both in, in diapers. Uh, as a kid, you know, Ed was fun and, and charming and smart. He also was competitive and uh, full of gumption. So, uh, so really nothing's changed, you know. Uh, it's been quite exciting to, to see my old friend uh, go from our tidy suburb north of Chicago where we used to ride bikes together uh, to become a prominent Hollywood director, producer, and writer with more than 20 movies and, and several TV shows to his name. Uh, his director credits include such hits as Glory, Legends of the Fall, Courage Under Fire, The Siege, The Last Samurai, Blood Diamond, Defiance, and Love and Other Drugs. As a producer, he shared in a Best Oscar for um, uh, Shakespeare in Love and garnered a Best Picture nomination for Traffic. Uh, and in the TV world, he created the acclaimed shows 30-something, Once and Again, and My So-Called Life. Uh, but as he recounts in his uh, very candid and, and very engaging memoir, Hits, Flops, and Other Illusions, uh, for all uh, uh, Ed's accomplishments, uh, what has done as, as much or, or more to shape who he is today have been his flops and disappointments and the self-examination and scrutiny that he drew from those tough experiences. What, what, what counts, as he conveys uh, uh, very well in the book, is how uh, when we do get knocked down, we figure out how to get back up. Uh, no question Ed's benefited from some good luck and supportive relationships along the way, including mentors like Sidney Pollack, as well as an enduring business partner in, in Marshall uh, Herskovitz, not to mention an enduring wife, uh, Liberty Gottschall. But his book also makes clear that uh, Ed's success uh, very much reflects his own abiding abilities to draw out the best in others and to remain true to his values and his vision. Uh, Ed announces at the start of the memoir that he's going to be dropping a lot of names, and he does. Tom Cruise, Denzel Washington, Brad Pitt, Leonardo DiCaprio, Daniel Craig, Julia Roberts, Anne Hathaway, Claire Danes, the list goes on. And those, uh, those all are stars uh, he's known, and he offers uh, sharp uh, observations uh, about them. But the book is, is more than just a, a behind-the-scenes look at some of Hollywood's leading personalities, as entertaining as, as all that is. Uh, much like Ed's movies, which have been not, not only entertaining, but about something, ab about ideas or historical truths, his book also uh, is about something more. Uh, it's a reflective, at times self-deprecating look at his own evolution as a filmmaker and professional storyteller. It's an instructional guide filled with lists of insightful tips for those wanting to direct or write or, or produce for the screen. Uh, and in its broadest sense, the book's a, a rumination on what's become of the, of the business of movie making, how hard it actually is to get anything made given the budget issues, the studio demands, and the capriciousness of uh, many actors. So um, read Ed's book, as I encourage all of you to do, and you'll better appreciate not, not only his artistic legacy, but also what it took to achieve it all. Uh, and you'll come away with an appreciation for his warmth, wit, and wisdom, as I've been privileged to experience all these years. In conversation with Ed, we're uh, very fortunate to have Ann Hornaday, who's now in her 22nd year as the Washington Post movie critic. She's also the author of a lively, instructive book about how to watch movies called Talking Pictures. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ed Zwick and Ann Hornaday.
Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> Hi, Ed. Hi, Ann. Hi, everybody. What a good crowd. Indeed. Does man, this happen look at all how the you time? Can pack a room, Damn. Ed Zwick. This is all for you. Yeah. It's all for you. Um, I'm going to dive right in. One of the most fascinating things, let's talk about structure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're a screenwriter. You, you mentioned early and often in this book that you really don't love exposition. Exposition bugs you. And one of the ways you express that is that you don't do the usual first chapter, here's my life story, you know? Right. Here's where I was born and grew up with Brad Graham. And <laughs> uh, you dole out this, your, your biographical information very subtly and weave it throughout the book. And it's beautiful, but I'm going to cheat and just say, do tell us a little bit about your life growing up. Oh, with Brad. boy. Okay. Where? where and, uh, well, see, Brad was no, no. All right, um, <laughs> I, I was, I was, uh, I was a theater kid. Start there. I think it's a pretty good start. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother had been the assistant to the director of the high school play of the same high school to which I attended. Um, and this is where this is in Winnetka, Illinois, in Winnetka, a high Illinois, school right. called New Fear High School. All right. And uh, I heard that. <laughs> um, and 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 my father. Um, was uh, uh, in several businesses um, uh, uh, to greater and lesser degree. And, uh, but he loved going to the movies um, the first weekend. And somehow the combination of the two of them created an alchemy that, that encouraged me to basically do whatever I want because the idea of being a filmmaker was not part of my plan at all. Uh, it was very much having to do with the theater. Um, I was a, I was a you know a kid who liked school, but most of the time was spent after school in that rehearsal room, on that stage, doing that horrible musical or or something far beyond our understanding and embarrassing ourselves. But nonetheless, it continued, and that went on through high school. Um, I I went to college. I went to Harvard, and it was a serious. Um, academic place, but in fact, I found myself again in the theater as much as out of it. But I was, um, you know, I was a, a middle class Jewish kid whose father had gone bankrupt, in fact, in college, um, where I, I needed to borrow money. And so I was um, daunted about making that leap. So I, um, I did what everyone is supposed to do I applied to law school. And to my astonishment, I was accepted, which caused an enormous crisis of confidence uh, and of faith because I didn't want to do it. And I knew if I did it, I would kill myself to do it well and would have a nervous breakdown by 30. And so I said no. And I got lucky enough to get a fellowship to go abroad. Um, my father, upon hearing that I was turning down Harvard Law School, uh, did not speak to me for two years. Oh, wow. Um, but in Paris, which is where I went, it turned out, I mean, I was there ostensibly to observe the experimental theater troops of Europe. Peter Brook was at the Bouffe du Nord. Um, uh, Ariane Nushkin was at the Théâtre du Soleil. And I did that for at least two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and what I really wanted to do was go to the movies. And Paris turns out to be the best place to watch movies, at least then, and I suspect now, in all the world, uh, revival houses, but more than that, the Cinematheque. And the Cinematheque, the dollar was very strong there. And for the cost of, I think, a dollar's worth of francs, you could go to a six o'clock and an eight o'clock and a 10 o'clock movie. And one day it would be uh, John Ford, and the next day it would be Fassbinder. Mm. And it was an education unto itself for a kid who loved movies, but then was suddenly understanding the notion of world movies. And then another thing happened, which was one of those life-changing um, coincidences, which is I ran into Woody Allen on the streets of Paris. I know that sounds ridiculous when you think of how paranoid he was then and what his life was like. We had had the occasion of um, corresponding once because I'd worked for a magazine while I was in college. And I was able to walk up to him with you know, 
temerity and a ridiculous um, pompousness and say that, well, we'd corresponded and uh, I hear you're making a movie here and might I come and visit the set? And he was exceedingly generous, um, probably wanted us to get away from this kid. And I he said, well, I'm at the George Sank, so call me sometime. And I was assumed he was blowing me off, but he wasn't. And when I called, he said, yeah, come by the set. And I did. And uh, what's uh, to my great uh, benefit, he was very lonely and he was did not speak French. And I was one of the few Americans around. And so he um, allowed me to ask the most presumptuous, ridiculous questions that only a 21-year-old could ask. And he graciously answered them. But what I observed at that moment was that he was not a filmmaker in that sense of knowing everything about exposure or lenses. He was a writer and he had a vision. He loved film. But he surrounded himself with extraordinarily gifted um, people who could execute that vision. And the penny dropped. Because I had always felt that I was somehow uh, abjured, you know, that, I, that I was not allowed to, to make movies because I wasn't that kid with the Bolex and I wasn't that kid walking around making my own movies. And so, rather than going back to New York, um, I applied to the American Film Institute and went to California. I was accepted. I don't know why. It was a lot easier to get in then. Um, but I was allowed, to, I went to California, never having been in California, or at least Southern California, for a day in my life. And uh, my life began there. It, it, it's, um, is this on, by the way? You can hear me. Um, and the fact that you, I mean, this is all, those were, the kismet of it all yeah. is just extraordinary. But then to land at the American Film Institute, which is such a rarefied place among film schools and film culture, tell us a little bit about what makes AFI, which has, by the way, been named the top film school in the country for the last few years. It has been. Um, and, and understandably so, but it really has a very distinct approach and programs. So yeah, tell absolutely. Us a bit it about was that. it was formed by Europeans. Um, a man named Frank Daniel created it and he was from the Prague Film School. And the Prague Film School is was the place that that spawned um, Milos Forman and uh, Ivan Passer and Andre Nemec and all those uh, uh, great great directors including a man who was then there at AFI named Jan Kadar. Jan Kadar was one of the great filmmakers of his time but a man who had almost been a kind of like a literary character because he had been jailed first by the Germans as a Jew, then jailed by the Russians when they came into Poland, to, to Czechoslovakia as a socialist. And then when he came to America, became suspected of being um, a, a radical by virtue of all the other things that had preceded this. And yet, so he was a, a very um, tough and um, a very stern, European master. At the same time, there was a woman there named, named Nina Fosch. She was the absolute legacy of Uta Hagen and Stella Adler and the Actor Studio. She'd been nominated for an Oscar in her um, years as a, as a starlet, really, as a studio starlet, but had become a teacher. The whole premise of the school was probably akin to something more like Juilliard than an academic program. You arrived, and on the second day, they handed you a camera, and they said, make a film. It didn't matter what you knew or didn't know. I knew the least, less than anybody. But you had to be each other's gaffer and sound man and act in it, and you were into this deep end of the pool right away. F schools, academic schools, believe that they can teach you in order to do something. A conservatory believes that you do something in order to learn it. And that's where my collaboration with Marshall Herskovitz began because you needed someone to have your back. It was a very competitive environment, as conservatories are, if you think of the great music conservatories. The premise at that time was there were 26 of us as directors and that six would matriculate into the second year and get the money to make a movie. So it's you that, can imagine. That cliche, look to your right, look to your left. Exactly, you know? it was that. Tell us about that meet cute with Marshall Herskovitz. Was it a meet cute? I mean, well, did you know right away, like, we're, we're destined to be collaborators and um, there, there There's a rom-com element to it, I think. Uh, but I think... How could there not be? Exactly. I think, I think the truth is, 
is something that I actually, I think I write it in the book. I don't remember what I wrote in the book or not. But um, there's a line from a Strindberg play which says, I feared you too much to become your enemy, so I became your friend. <laughs> he was the most formidable and clearly talented and gifted of everyone. And I'd like to think that I absolutely sidled up to him and managed to um, ingratiate myself. Um, he would tell that story differently because his internal experience of that was utterly different. But we, between the two of us, over time, not just there, but continuing afterwards, because there is no such thing as continuing education. And my ability to retain the amount that was given me in film school was not good. I, 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 the, I hadn't yet understood what they were trying to, trying to tell me. And so I came out of film school as a very talented mimic. And I would do work that then would disappoint me and pretty much everybody else. And um, Marshall was there as his work was not really growing either. We were there to push each other and to become each other's scourge and to try to understand what it was that we weren't doing that we might eventually be able to figure out what to do. Um, and that then yielded, after some real trial and error, some real struggle, some disappointment, it yielded a piece that finally did reflect us. And that changed the landscape. Right, and, and we're gonna get to that in a moment, just the crucible out, out of which that came, and then the crucible of, of it, yeah, uh, which is revelatory in the book, and we're talking about 30-something mm -hmm. in this case. I wanna jump ahead, though, chronologically, because it relates to Nina Fosh. You have these wonderful um, sections of the book where you, they're like little mini tutorials, you know, and, and lessons that you've learned over the years, or, or just, you know, lists of pointers, or. Um, do's and don'ts and at one point you have nine lessons from Nina yeah and one of them and a lot of it does have to do with working with actors and one of them is create an unforeseen obstacle and this comes into play during courage under fire mm -hmm. could you tell us that story okay it has to do with Denzel and a bicycle oh god that's that's a good story because I think what it what it suggests is this kind of unspoken intimacy that occurs between actors and directors over time. Um, when it's working, it becomes this almost um, nonverbal communication, I guess, such that I could walk out from behind a camera at the end of a take and he would see me walk out there and say, yeah, I know. <laughs> and that would be giving direction and taking direction. Um, now, that's a legacy of having spent hours together, whether it's doing research or whether it's talking about a script or talking about your children or your parents or whatever it was, but it's creating a certain kind of bond. Let me hasten to say there's never been a foot of film that Denzel Washington has ever shot that I couldn't have used, take one, move on. But you have notions of, uh, and, and you want to play, you have a Ferrari in front of you that you could just turn the wheel a little bit and go screaming around a corner and you say, well, what happens if I just do that? And, and that's a, an enormous privilege. But the story is really about him as an actor. And they have, there are several stories about him in there and they, both, they all reflect the same thing, which is this remarkable capacity of being present. And that sounds normal, but to be present when you have 50 people and a, an ocular, you know, glass lens in your face and, and the, um, the stakes of millions of dollars and the, and, and the um, influences of everything that has come before and your ambition and all of this, and to get rid of all of that and be there in that moment is probably the hardest thing that an actor can do. And you try to learn that in Meisner class with relaxation and you try to learn it in exercise and you try to learn it by virtue of all the work that you've done but finally it comes from some deep inner ability to do that. So the story is very simple, which is that it's the last moment uh, in Courage Under Fire, or one of the last moments, um, we weren't shooting it last. It's a simple shot, the camera is looking up in the sky because it meant it dissolves, if you've seen the movie, as Meg Ryan sort of climbs up in a helicopter and sort of disappears because she's dead and and then the camera comes down from the sky and dissolves to the front of the house 
and under the camera walks Denzel Washington carrying his bags. And he's been away, gone through an alcoholic um, bender, confronted the parents of a man whose death for whom he feels responsible. And he's carrying these bags into the house and we say action and the camera goes down and he walks to the house, done, cut, print, move on. But we had a little bit of time and Roger Deakins was the cinematographer, a genius in his own right, as you, some of you probably know. And you know, I said, listen, Roger, do you think if we waited a few minutes, or he said, do you think if we waited a few minutes, we can wait for a little better sky and it'll match better? And I said, sure. And Denzel was over there talking on his phone and people were not paying attention. And I was just looking at the front of the house and it didn't look like my house and I didn't know why and I realized it was too neat. And I turned to the prop guy, I said, what have you got on the truck? And he said, is that a bike? Yeah, it's a bike. Well, can we just take that bike and put it out there? And he gave me the bike and probably in violation of 100 union rules, I took the bike and wheeled it onto the set, and I just laid it across the walkway. Um, and I went, ah, this is better. Anyway, sky's better, Roger says we're ready to go, Denzel's called off the phone, he joins us. I don't say a word to him. I say, okay, we're ready to go, action. The camera comes down out of the sky, and as it comes, Denzel walks from under camera, walks down the road, down the path toward his house, and there's a bike there. Now, certain actors would say, hey, what, what the fuck is this bike doing here? You know, and others might sort of dance around the bike. But Denzel is walking there to his house, carrying his bags, and there's a bike, and it's one of his children's bikes. And so he stops, he sets down the bag, he reaches down and he lifts the bike and he rights it and just puts it upright and then grabs the bags and then walks back into the house. And, I, and that is the moment that I begin crying in the movie because um, it's the metaphor for all that he has gone through and putting his life right. I will claim no credit for having come up with that idea. The only credit I will have come up with is creating a circumstance in which he can be present. And that's often changing a little bit of blocking or a line because what the camera loves best is when something happens on an actor's face, in their body movements or whatever. And so, you know, there were, the moment that made his career had to do with, you know, a tear coming down his face as he was being whipped, which he knew was happening and he created the inner um, experience to make that happen, but was also aware of when the camera was going to be there and be in focus and the light was right. And that duality, that ability to maintain both the technical and professional aspect in the midst of a deep emotional, genuine experience is singular. You say, you call it in the book, that's it. It's, it's akin, if not being kissed by the angel. It's, it's that conscious, that self-consciousness at the same time of being utterly in the moment. That's and right. You're, it, it is. It's like I, and as a writer, I know as a critic, it's the hardest thing for me to write about because you know when you're in the presence of it, and I would imagine as a director, I mean, do you know, it, 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 this also gets to just screen acting and the alchemy uh, between an actor and the camera. Mm-hmm. Um, so that they could be the greatest actor in the world on the stage, but they don't have that relationship with the camera. And, and what accounts for, have you been able to figure this out? Uh, um, <laughs> Explain it to me, please. Um, I, 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 you know, I think my wife once called it movie skin. Movie skin. The idea that it. something is translucent that you can see into. Yeah. But more than that, I think it has to do with the inner life. What is happening internally, um, and it's not just what is internally in that scene, but people who have a very vivid experience and an intense experience of every moment, a kind of, we know people like that. They're, they're not just actors, they're people who you are around who, who shimmer in a particular way. And, and the camera sees that, the camera can look into it and you can say it's the shape of the eye or the size of the iris or it's or not. The golden ratio or it's, something it's like that. It's none of those yeah, things. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use that sports car metaphor one more time. You, we've all seen a, a, like a car on a hot day and from far away and the way that the light 
shimmers around it, the way it's disturbed. That's what it's like to be in the presence of people like that. Mm -hmm. they, they, they have something that is ineffable, but you know it when you see it. And of course, you're talking about Glory, the, the movie mm -hmm. that you made, the first movie you made with Denzel that launched this amazing collaboration that you've had over the years. Um, and this is one of the most captivating chapters of the mm. passages of the book in terms of just the, that production, working with him and that en en ensemble, um, working with a very young Matthew Broderick, who was, I, I gather that TriStar, the studio that made the film, really only made it if he would star in it because he was just coming off of Ferris Bueller, which, you know, of course, <laughs> of course, get Ferris, right? You know, like for the Civil War drama. I mean, Exactly. Welcome to Hollywood. Um, so tell us a little bit. <laughs> and that was kind of a cru uh, another crucible yeah, for you. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a very cruel thing to do to a 24-year-old to give them that kind of responsibility. And I don't know what I would have done if that responsibility had put on my shoulders. But when you're 24 and an actor, and already susceptible in the way that an actor is, and you are surrounded by a legion of fluffers and handlers and managers, all of whom are telling you what you should do or should be, who you should work with. I actually can understand how he at that moment saw a young director who had done this sort of talk fest, this whiny talk fest, 30 something, and I was a television guy. I'd made one movie and he'd worked with Mike Nichols and he'd worked with this one and that one. And, and I think that he was in fact put in a position of having to accept the depredations of his mother and of his management, of his agent, and it led to a whole set of very ugly circumstances. Um, he, they gave the script to other, unbeknownst to me, to other screenwriters, asking if they wanted to write to, to rewrite it. Fortunately, they didn't because they liked it. To bring in other people to who would presumably help me in some way, and I, I don't blame him for that. What I blame him for is having been passive. And that's often what an actor at a certain moment is. Um, they don't understand how to impose themselves. You watch actors as they gain experience, as they become, many of them directors, believe me, they're good at that when they get there, but not, not at that age. You know, it's, it's, it is a recurring theme in this book, this passive aggressiveness, especially among actors, where they just, you know, as brave as they are, as, as much courage as they bring to their performances, they're amazingly callow when it comes to confrontation. Fear, fear. Or telling that, you know, just having to tell a hard truth. Fear makes people um, make bad choices. Mm. And, and also, you have to understand about actors, which is the, the more they get into that circumstance, the better they get at receiving. And they get so much coming at them, coming at them all the time, that when you add your voice to that, you're just someone else coming at them. Mm. And, you know, there's also, it, it's also to be understood because the vulnerability of putting yourself out there, and this is an irony about this book, having written a book in the first person and exposed myself in a certain way that I never have before, to see them out there where people only perceive the movie as a success or failure, mostly based on them, that they believe that their lives could begin or end at that moment because they're in, not capable of engendering the thing that will serve them in the next movie. They're at the mercy of a script or a studio, as opposed to, say, a writer or a director who can maybe reinvent their universe. So there's great, great anxiety um, that is added to a circumstance where you are in a foreign city, away from everyone you know, um, in an environment that is pressured uh, with millions of dollars on the line, and people sometimes make bad choices. Um. I want to stay on glory just for a moment, and then and then get into it, explore some of those bad choices that are which are fascinating. <laughs> um, always the best part, right? But glory, you know, over the years, especially since I've been working at the Washington Post, um, the issue of factual accuracy has mm -hmm. just become more and more salient. And I think, you know, I, as a, as a critic, I've always been well. It's it's an artistic interpretation. Um, this, you know, this, 
the audience, it's, it's really the, the, the onus is on the audience mm -hmm. to be sophisticated enough to understand that this is an interpretive and a piece of art. And I think that since coming to Washington, I, I, do, I have really gained more respect for the people who were either participants in these events that are being depicted on screen or they are scholars in those events and know them like the backs of their hands or they were eyewitnesses. And it really bugs them when a film, especially a filmmaker, because cinema has that distinct, singular, if not unique ability to take root as the narrative. As the permanent record. As the permanent record and as of consensus history. Um, I do think, I, I've come around, I'm a little less cavalier, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but as I've explored these questions, when I talk to historians, um, Glory is always mentioned as a gold standard. Mm. I mean, they always mention that film as just being a wonderful textbook of how to do it right in terms of staying true to the facts and when taking artistic license, doing it responsibly. So t was that a prime value for you? Is it still, I mean, where do you come down on, on these questions? Yeah, well, I mean, first, first of all, I would say the, the miracle of Glory is that the facts themselves, to greater and lesser degree, corresponded to some dramatic unity. That it that those so lucky for you, it lucky to lucky for me, way. or right. that I was able to at least glean that yeah. that the, the leach out, you know, sort of take out what was there, and I didn't have to boulderize those things. I did not have to falsify the shape of yeah. the piece. What I took license was to give the breath of life to the people who were unknown to us, the characters in the tent, even Shaw, his friendship. There were letters, but they were in some way inscrutable in the way that letters of that period are often inscrutable, and certainly no letters by those men. Um, so there was that sort of tension, but opportunity, that if I conformed to the shape, and the, the part of the shape that is, in fact, most remarkable is that it, it is a tragedy. It has some sense of doom about it, that these men, having committed to do this thing, were in fact even aware of the possibility that that's where it ended. And, and a wonderful professor that I had in college said, the thing about tragedy is that it is the most restful. So that as we watch this happening toward this thing, we allow ourselves to then connect to the people and see the, the personal cost and struggles and relationships, the interrelationships among them. On the other hand, there's a genre element. And the genre element is the World War II drama with the Italian kid and the kid from, you know, from the South and the, 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 that this plucky band of men are just gonna come together and take that hill. And genre helps you. Genre, genre makes an audience feel comfortable so it's not to be diminished in its in its effect. But do you think we've? Bec I mean, are we too now with with Wikipedia at the ready? Mm. I don't. Does it? Do you think we've taken it almost too far? You know, is there room for interpretation anymore? Or well, there. I mean, there has to be because film is necessarily reductionist. Right. I mean, you know, politics and um, and social issues are complex and nuanced. And the dynamism of film obliges you to do it all within two hours. So necessarily you're gonna make something more uh, simplified or you're gonna be, use ellipses or you're gonna you know, leave things out and that's gonna happen. I think it finally comes down to intents and purposes. You know, if it is a, an exploitative commercial venture designed to take advantage of a situation and not explore what was at its heart then I think you can tear it to hell. I think if it comes from a place of um, legitimate understanding and research, then I think it can be given a pass. Right, I think Tony Kushner once told me, it doesn't have to be true to be honest. Well, that the other, and I'm probably no, 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 mangling that. No, 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 but in there, fact, it, the, the phrase is, it, is it facts are sometimes the enemies of truth. That's. See, leave it to Ed Zwick, you know, when in doubt, kick it to Zwick, that's my motto. I want to get back to the, <laughs> when we're talking about the bad decisions, one of the most um, engrossing passages in this book has to do with your involvement with Shakespeare in Love. 
engrossing just because of all of the personalities that come into play, starting with the great Tom Stoppard. I mean, oh my goodness, you have this amazing time with him, which must have been like being on... On it was the, the sun, it was know? the fulfillment of a lifelong dream. I think the first thing I did in college was a was a was a sort of little production of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. So I was I was that fanboy, and I was that fanboy going to meet that man, and um, that was it had it had nothing else happened but that, probably would have been enough. Oh, I I'm with you all the way. But then, and I don't want to no spoilers. But then there's this great series of counterfactual cinematic counterfactuals <laughs> my favorite genre which is the w great what ifs what if so and so had been you know cat like you know what if betty davis had been in gone with the wind well there are so many different permutations of that in this production which did go through many ups and downs um but there was a world in which that might have been a movie starring ray fines and julia roberts yep <laughs> Should we t do you want to? Has this been rehearsed to death? Or? Well, no. I mean, it, it's it's uh, I mean, it's it's one of those things. Just when you thought it was safe to go back into the water, I mean, it, it's it's <laughs> you're buffeted by one thing and then you're buffeted by another. But um, I don't even know what I know is rather than recounting it because I do recommend it as a a, a, a horror story. With a with a, with an ambivalent happy ending, yes. um, but but I know that I came through that better prepared for everything that awaited me. That that in fact I was bulletproof because I had survived, and and not only that I had survived, but I was then able to do that next thing that might not have happened had it happened, and all the things that have followed it. Um, our legacy of a, a traumatic experience, yeah. as those things often do. Um, so, you know, again, uh, that's another 24-year-old. Uh, maybe that was a bad age for me to, to have worked with. Julia was that age when she was doing it. Well, and, and Go ahead. I don't, again, I don't want to tell the whole story because it's great, but, but, you know, she was, it was at a moment when Daniel Day-Lewis was, was hot. And, and I, I remember, <laughs> Being just as in love with him as she was, I had, you know, we had seen him in Beautiful Laundrette, we had seen him in Morris, and was was it Morris or? And my left foot too. And my left foot, but I was I remember being in London for a friend's wedding, and I stayed an extra day, a great considerable considerable expense to me in my twenties, just to see him in a play, a tiny little black box theater, the National. And I'll never, you know, it was just worth every penny and every minute. So I understand, you know, she wanted him very badly to be her coast, her Romeo. The, there's a there's a mirroring effect in Hollywood romances. You often find um, an actor and an actress finding each other at a similar moment oh, in their careers. And I think it's I think it's maybe in the search of something that is not just a mirror, but also maybe a kind of um, oh, what's the word? Um, a license or 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 that and it, uh, something that they've earned or there's a and you often find those relationships cratering when the trajectories depart yeah and i think she saw herself as she was at that moment as that skyrocketing star and why shouldn't she be paired up with Daniel Day Lewis. Oh, she's got great. I mean, apps, and he's a fantastic. You know, it's yes, good, no. It's a I good mean, idea. She, uh, but the way that it plays out, and this gets again, there was this weird passive aggressive thing where he doesn't quite ever tell her no. You know, he kind of like everybody fought no, it fact, off on you, fact, Ed's wit fact, to, I, to tell have, people I the have, bad news. I have great suspicion that he said yes in certain other ways. Oh. You know, Did when I you come to that? politics and prose on a Wednesday night, ladies and gentlemen, this is what you get. You get the tea. You get the hot, the hot tea from Ed Zwick. Um, you, and your evidence? <laughs> uh, I, I, I do not kiss and tell. Now, and in fact, I was, I, was tried, I was scrupulous in the book to think that there were certain things that were off limits. I mean, I think that if people are still stupid enough to behave badly in front of a writer, they deserve what they get. That's exactly right. But those Thank things you. that you find out, you know, um, off st off camera yeah. in certain ways, no reason to go into them. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, 
you warn us at the beginning of the book that you're going to drop some names, but there's one in particular that I found fascinating, which is out of the blue, Merrick Garland, your good friend Merrick Garland. What? <laughs> Wait a minute. Well, Please Brad explain. figures into this into this conversation, and so does um, someone else in this room now. Um, we went. We had the same accident of education at the Cambridge School of Entitlement and Self Regard. Um, <laughs> And yeah, you're commended for not mentioning it for the least of the, the I, first five I, or ten minutes. I, I did. I slipped it out. Um, um, and uh, he became the boyfriend of my college girlfriend, and then they he lived with, shared a house with Brad, and Brad and I had been childhood friends, and Brad then went to work for. On the desk at the Washington Post of the defense of the Department of Defense, without the defense desk, what would that be called? Yes, yeah, okay. And so that I was, I was ending up making movies, and this is utterly coincidental, about subjects that pertained to his life um, and what Merrick did. And my um, intention always is to get to the source material and to talk to the people who are in on the ground and to get from that the things that you cannot get from books, which is the anecdotal stuff and the experiential stuff. And in a couple of cases, um, I, I know particularly in terms of when we did the siege, that, that Merrick was able to help us get in touch with the, the, the FBI CIA counterterrorism task force in New York and make an introduction. That's all, but that's a lot because you know he had been involved with terrorism starting with Oklahoma City. And it's one thing, and I went and met these guys and spent some time with them and talked to them, and they were rather close-lipped. But there is nothing better than bringing a movie star <laughs> into that office, and things change in a hurry. Um, and it was the same thing with Annette Benning when we met a couple of, of um, agents who were, um, uh, what's the word, on undercover, what's that word? Uh, yeah, well, there's a word for what they are when they are not not um, known to be what they're doing. It doesn't matter. Um, uh, Annette, too, was able to spend time, and that's invaluable. Um, and the same thing was true even before that when we were doing um, Courage Under Fire. Through a different source, we got to spend time riding around with the armored cavalry in Fort Irwin in California. And I went with Denzel. And it's never quite clear what an actor is taking but they are sponges. And he was very quiet during the whole 24 hours and night maneuvers and all of that. But I had noticed something that, I had noticed that, that um, the, the, the officers were in their late 20s and the enlisted men were probably 20 or 22. But the 28 year olds would turn to the, um, to the enlisted men and call them son. <laughs> this kind of paternalistic thing that they would adapt. I paid no attention to it, I noticed it. And on the second day of filming, when we're working um, in a scene, a normal scene, and the dialogue was not written, Denzel turned and referred to this uh, enlisted man as son. And it was all about this sort of weird kind of uh, sort of assimilation of something. DiCaprio, when he went out to drink Jägermeister with smugglers, picked up there, he was so intent on getting the, the dialect right, it wasn't just that, he wanted to be so good that he could improvise with the expressions. And he would, uh, you know, call them China and the various things that he did. And what does that do? It just gives a whole other layer of verisimilitude to a mm -hmm. performance. We are going to open it up for questions from all of you. Please use this microphone. We're streaming tonight, so it's really important that your questions come out over the microphone. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I'd like to uh, say that I've been on your sets a, a number of times. Uh -oh. and I've, uh, I've really had a good time. My uh, sister-in-law was your production manager. But uh, you mentioned Woody Allen before, and I want to know from, from someone that's in Hollywood, is he still canceled out there? Um, I think probably, given the fact that he's had to make movies um, in the last number of years in Europe, that's probably yes. His, his latest movie's in French. Yeah. So, uh, but it is going to get U.S. distribution. Is it? Mm-hmm. Ah. 
I think it's due but out this how spring. Is, is, how do they feel about him in, in uh, well, Hollywood? Well, they. I, I just don't know, do, what does they do, mean? It's one of those your things. Your contemporaries. Um, I, I think everyone is, you know, has their own opinion of this man, although the opinion of his work that goes without saying. I think you're raising a very interesting question, which could spend several hours, and Anne, I think, has written about as well, which is about can one um, separate what one knows or believes about an artist in their personal life as compared to their work? And I think that it is a very important topic, and I think at the end of the day, um, they actually need to be understood, but there, there is a difference in degree and a difference in kind. And there's a tendency, as there was many often years in the Me Too movement to um, uh, smush things together, where Roman Polanski was spoken of in the same verse, uh, same words as Woody Allen. Those aren't equivalences. And I think our tendency is to just assume them. So. Th thank you. No. Thank you both so much for being here tonight. Uh, this has been such a treat. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Zwick, in the About Last Night chapter, you, you described the the, the pissing match, as you put it, between you and Jim Belushi uh, on the L train in Chicago. Uh -huh. uh, and <laughs> I just have to laugh, just the, the image of you two exchanging <laughs> FUs on the platform in the snow, and then the doors closing, <laughs> and you and the crew having to loop around the track uh, for the retake. Uh, it's uh, one of my favorite stories because it leads to the happiest ending. Yes, yes, it's so good. Well, I was going to say that that experience for you, it, you, it allowed you to uh, uh, have the experience where, where you have a realization that's, that's served you ever since in, in which that as a director, uh, although you're an authority figure, you are still a human being with emotions and fear, but you also learn that the more real your relationships are, the more really, the more authentic your work becomes. And uh, and I would just say that that's a lesson, as there are many I think that I've observed that don't only have to do with making movies. I think having to do with exposing oneself and one's vulnerabilities can only lead in a good way. Right. And and, and I will add that Jim Belushi and I had dinner in Chicago two nights ago. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. After saying fuck you on the L for. <laughs> in the snowstorm for t too long. All right, so you hugged it out, that's good. Yeah. Uh, you know, so my, my question was, uh, what, is, what, is, what does that look like on, on, on set? Uh, you opening your heart out to, to another actor, and, and do they in turn open up theirs? And, Wait, and let's, let's, be, let's be realistic. Um, it's not um, a sensitivity training session. Um, it's really about what works. If I wanna be really honest, because some people want to be that, and other people would run screaming from the set if you came to them, you know, opening your heart. It, and my job is actually to try to understand what will work best, and whether that's being an authority figure, or being seductive, or a comic, or um, a neurotic, or whatever it is, it's so I can get what I want, when I want it, in focus. And I think that's, the, the flip side of this very kumbaya conversation. Um, it's sometimes about being in touch with your inner son of a bitch. <laughs> thank there you. you Thanks for the question. I thank you for being here tonight. Quick question, might answer in the book. I unfortunately haven't been able to read it yet, obviously. <laughs> What's your favorite movie and how does it inspire you, I, I guess as a storyteller? That's I, a great th question. It's, it's an impossible question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Or like a top five or something. I, I just, I mean, movie ask away. Anne that question. She'll, she'll have a well, nervous breakdown. The way breakdown. to phrase that is, what's your favorite movie today? Yeah, right. Because yeah, it right. always change. Um, uh, God, uh, The Seven Samurai. There you go. Okay. Um, because sure. if you were stuck on a desert island and there were n other, no other way to learn filmmaking, everything that you want to learn is in that movie done brilliantly or else invented. And whether that's action or characterization or humor or geography or or exposition, it's all there. Great answer. You know what I would say for the same reason is the best years of our lives. Oh boy. I feel like it's the same thing. It's just every craft area is at its height of execution in that film. Mm -hmm. And it's just a brilliant emotional experience. Yeah. But and this segues if I may, I, do you have another question? No. Oh. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> 
w- the sweep of this book is really, for such a young man, um, it's really amazing what you've witnessed in terms of this industry changing mm-hmm. and evolving, we might say devolving, but so could you just give us, in the, in the time we have left, hmm. your impressions right now. I, I, you're a member of the Academy. Um, you're in the process of watching and voting and mm-hmm. ruminating and nominating, but could just give us your sense of things at the present and where even, they might be going. Even over the course of writing a book that takes a year and a year to publish it, I think the world has changed even more. Yeah. Uh, I mean... I would say that it began it began with um, an FCC determination of studios being able to own their product and television. Mm-hmm. And it began with the collapse of the DVD, which was basically supporting right. movies of substance and ambition because they didn't have to make their money then. They could make them later, and particularly to grown-ups who would buy them. Mm-hmm. And then finally, it was the acquisition of studios as loss leader to multinational corporations who then began to impose the P&L projections quarterly on those studios. And the only way you can do that is to create what they called four quadrant movies, movies that would appeal to everyone. Well, you look at your list of your favorite movies and you tell me that it appeals to everyone because that's not what great movies were. They were disruptive or they were challenging or they were upsetting or ambitious in a particular way and now with streaming you have retail companies making decisions about product and how do retail companies make product they make product by testing them by submitting them to these kind of weird um, algorithms and and the sense of of a collective consensus by the team that's another Silicon Valley introduction that has happened the team because that's not how great movies were made, for better or worse, with Louis B. Mayer or goddamn him Harvey Weinstein. They were single people who were making these decisions and allowing a kind of eccentricity and a kind of singularity of sensibility to emerge. And now when you go on, stop me, and when you go on Netflix or, or these, the, the, the interfaces and you go from one movie to the next to the next, they all seem oddly similar. They're not individuated, right? And they're not marketed to be different. And so you are unsatisfied. Somebody else has stepped Thank you for that reflection. Jorge. Ed, can I call you Ed? <laughs> um, what I'm not sure a lot of people know is that you were a foot soldier in a movie by Woody Allen um, where you played a soldier war walking into Russia, I think. Yeah. It was called Love and Death. Yes, this is true. That's so funny, yeah. Uh, It's the first time I saw you, uh, (laughs) and somebody said to me, this guy is a classmate of yours. He's in the movie. I'll tell you you a better story about that movie, (laughs) which is that, uh, obviously, I came to know Diane Keaton, who was on the movie, and I came to know that they had been lovers before. And then... Later, uh, he showed me a script called Anadonia, meaning the inability to experience pleasure. It was a 200-page script. But it was about a relationship between two people who had been lovers who no longer were but were then able to work together. And it blew my mind because there was someone taking the base metal of experience of this relationship and turning it into this wonderful romantic comedy. And it had a profound effect on me 10 years later when I presumed to do the same thing to my own life. Hmm. And of course, that became Annie Hall. It was Annie be. Hall, and what it, and 30-something is wedded entirely to that. So, so the, the question I wanted to ask you comes from remembering that you were in a war movie, right? You have a particular interest in war movies. I mean, you filmed some incredible scenes yeah, but so did Shakespeare glory. and so did Homer. I mean, it's it's kind of easy. <laughs> it's you it, know, it's 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 drama for nothing. Yeah, it is. It's this very clear, you know, tableau in which you can tell personal stories. I'm not sure it's war itself. It's maybe about heroism or leadership or the issues within it. Samurai. And yes. Samurai. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> So, dare I, given the state of things, 
is there room for Ed Zwick in an Ed Zwick film? Tell us what's next. What what are you? Where are you going these days? Um, we're we're well. I we've written an adapt an adaptation of a new Stephen King novel, <laughs> but not the Stephen King of fantasy and horror. It's more of the Stephen King of Stand by Me and uh, Shawshank. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to think that's it's cheating a little bit because that's like Tiffany all the way and mm -hmm. DiCaprio is involved in it. So we, we're going to get a little bit of a pass, I think, in a world that doesn't make those movies in the same way that that, um, you know, Oppenheimer got a pass. That's what I was going to say. Did, yeah. did last year give you I mean, last year there was lots of good news last year. You bet. I think so, too. Um, and maybe because there's a softening in the Marvel Universe and maybe. I don't know, though, because the audiences have had a lot of time to have strayed from serious, ambitious, complex, grown-up material. Usually, you think an audience has to be trained. I don't think they're based on Oppenheimer. They're going to flock back into serious movies. But maybe the, the, the studios, which always learn the wrong lesson, yeah. will think that that's the thing that's going to get them back. That's so true. You know, that's what I always maintained. The studios learned the wrong lesson from Jaws because it wasn't the effects and the shark. It was the, the guys. It was the right. human story that Spielberg got so right. Uh, but they took the wrong, you know, they, right. took, they went the, um, but, you know, and then it's also, a, a, I think, if I may be so bold, the audience for those films now, because of darn COVID, really became so acclimated to streaming you know to seeing that kind of material i mean i just it's it's almost like well, an it's, audience development it's it's been it's been it's issue. been a downhill trend even back yeah, to, that to, had been to accelerated. But, but even go back go back to the fact that when the movies that moved me and and the whole audience were those that you did not think you could see again that's right they were ephemeral that's right you thought okay well i have to pay such attention or i have to talk about it all night long with my friends and yeah. maybe they'll be on television again but the minute that you could stop, the minute you could check your phone, the minute that you knew you could see it again, your relationship to movies began to change. Yeah. And at the same time that that happened, there was the, the, the coming of games and the coming of, of um, YouTube and the coming of so many other distractions that have taken its place actually as paramount in that food chain. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we are no longer, the movies are no longer that sort of um, thing that changes the conversation. Well, I still think they can. I mean, last year told me that they it's still possible. You know, people still want to go and have that collective experience. And you want to have your job. Well, no, I mean, oh, <laughs> listen, I mean, there's plenty for me to write about. <laughs> Which is why I want you to keep on making your movies, Fair that's enough. Rick. Fair enough. Um, I think we're out of time. The epigram that opens this book is, I did not tell the half of what I saw, so we're eagerly awaiting the second <laughs> half. Thank you so much for Thank joining us, Ed. Thank you. Congratulations.